Welcome. Um, I'm John Rupel. I'm a faculty member here at the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment at uh, the University of Utah's S.J. Quinney College of Law. And welcome back to the 25th Annual Wallace Stegner Center Symposium. It's my pleasure to introduce Lori Restino. Lori is the founder and principal uh, of Strategies for Sustainable Futures, as well as a visiting scholar at the George Washington University Law School. Previously, Lori served as the first director of the Center for Agricultural and Food Systems at Vermont Law School, which she built in one of the most comprehensive law and policy programs for sustainable food systems in a nation. Prior to joining the faculty at Vermont Law School, Lori practiced environmental law for 20 years at the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C., advising both the U.S. Forest Service and Natural Resources Conservation Service on myriad environmental issues. Lori holds a BA from the University of Michigan, a JD from the University of Iowa, and a master's in public administration from George Mason University, as well as a certificate in executive leadership from American University. So, Lori, I'll hand it over to you to talk about the Farm Bill. Thank you so much. And um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate the invitation from the, from the law school to uh, talk about the Farm Bill. I want to have one correction in my bio. I'm actually no longer GW as a visiting scholar, but I am teaching at Johns Hopkins Environmental Policy, and I'm a lecturer there. So just wanted to get that on the record. Um, and I'm going to try to share my PowerPoint, because I have one as well. So yeah, today I'm going to be talking about the Farm Bill, um, the past. So I'm going to be giving some context, which I think is really important to understand where we're at today and, um, and really start connecting those dots. Like um, Michael was just talking about, I, I try to be a systems thinker. I think that's incredibly important for this area, which comprises many areas of the law, as Michael was also saying. I come to food and agriculture from the environmental perspective, um, uh, which I think is a helpful um, counterpoint or complementary to uh, the food law perspective that um, Michael was just discussing. So let me, so why would we talk about the Farm Bill? Michael alluded to this a bit in his presentation, but um, you know, and I think this is a really good thing with the interest in food that's really um, grown just in the last, I would say in the last decade or so, the public's interest, especially millennials engagement in food and food systems and sustainable food and all of its tentacles like animal welfare and pesticide exposure, clean water, all those things or safe drinking water. Um, I think that's great. And it's really putting kind of a new spotlight on the farm bill, which you know, for much of my practice years uh, at the USDA was really the province of only a few groups, a few um, uh, industry groups or um, uh, associations and a handful of environmental groups and other uh, stakeholders and special interests. So I say, think the food movement writ large is great for really shining a light on the farm bill and more engagement. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, the Farm Bill touches everyone. Um, President Obama famously said that it's like a Swiss army knife, and it really is. It's got a whole bunch of stuff in it. Um, and I'm going to talk about that, too, and how we got to the place where we, where we have all these different kinds of policies wrapped up into one omnibus piece of legislation. Um, and lately, because, you know, I was thinking about this presentation, um, I started my career actually as an attorney for the Forest Service and most of my work was out west. Um, the idea of land or our, our conceptions of property, um, the relationship between uh, especially the western states and the federal government is, is quite a bit different than in the east. So I started thinking about the Farm Bill too as a lands bill. So I'll touch upon that later on in the presentation, um, but I thought I'd mention that now to kind of maybe prime the pump a little bit. And um, also, as Michael alluded, it's actually a unique legislative vehicle. It, because it's passed every four or five years, um, it's, it's a sizable amount of policy that lasts you know, more than a, a yearly appropriation, which means that its policies can be quite impactful, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a not so good way. The other thing about it is not only does it um, authorized, but it also has significant appropriations. And normally, as you know, uh, with legislation, you have to have both 
authorization appropriations and they tend to be separate processes, but that's not the case for a large chunk of the farm bill. So again, it could be very highly impactful because of that. So as I noted before, I'm gonna cover kind of the origins and development. Um, and then I wanna to look toward the future, which I think is really the more compelling thing that, that it's important to do. And I did wanna note as well, uh, the coronavirus is really shining a light, I think, on issues we're having in our fundamental societal governance and government um, in the vulnerability of many, many people um, and so as I go through this, I, I do think there's great relevancy and I'll try to bring that out too as, as, we, as we go forward. Wanted to start off with this. This is the current farm bill, so I'm jumping all the way ahead, but I'm gonna go back to the beginning in a second. But um, just wanted to give people a lay of the land. So we're talking about a lot of money. This is the Farm Bureau, but it's, it's you know, it's, they lay out these things pretty well. They're basing it on the, uh, probably on the, um, yeah, the Congressional Budget Office, CBO. So you can see the outlays in funding. And what's also really important here is that, of course, the majority, a huge chunk is for nutrition. And that's very important. The traditional um, coalition that would pass the Farm Bill every four or five years, as Michael noted, it used to be essentially liberal urban uh, congresspersons and then more conservative rural um, congresspersons. And that over the last couple of farm bills has actually eroded. And there has been, I think, um, and rightly so, some debate regarding whether or not that fundamental coalition has gone by the wayside and whether we should be rethinking how we address these policies. Oh, I do want to say one last thing about the spending. So you'll see that there's a five and a 10 year baseline. And that's because even though the farm bills generally only last four or five years, some have actually last six years, um, the spending can go beyond that five years because of the nature of the agreements or the partnerships or whatever financial assistance is going out. And that's why um, you see those two baselines. So as I used to joke around with my students, um, if I ask you a question in my class, you get a, generally have a 50% chance of getting it right if you just answer FDR. So we, um, we have to look all the way back to, um, to really the Great Depression to see the, the roots of the current farm policy. And I think that's important to remember because one of my contentions is that really the farm bill is kind of an an old framework um, that is we're trying to superimpose on postmodern and post climate change problems. So I think it's worth kind of bearing that in mind and seeing what seeing what the roots were. As you know, during the New Deal, there were there was a boom actually in the federal bureaucracy, and nearly every part of society got significant support um, from the the slew of programs that were passed. But I think, and I think it's fair to say that the farm or agriculture sector has maintained its very intimate and, in, and entangled relationship with the federal government in ways that are um, uh, very unique. Um, and there are good reasons for that and reasons that I, I think um, probably aren't as valid. Um, so in any event, what happened with, uh, with the ag sector during the Great Depression, as we all would remember, is um, it, it was post World War One, and um, there had been a boom actually during World War One for for ag producers. Not surprisingly, because they were really helping feed um, uh, feed our allies as well as America. Um, and then and then there was uh, increased debt during that time as as farms expanded production. And then when you had the uh, Great Depression, um, that crash. And then you had you know the addition of to the Dust Bowl um, and. Uh, which was the result of really breaking out lands that should have never been um, should have never been put into production in any event. And then we see really over the next decade or so from that period a bunch of different laws that really try to um, or several key different laws that try to kind of claw back some of those lands essentially and and put them back into grasslands or whatever. Um, and that also resonates today too. We still actually have a soil erosion problem. I'm gonna to touch upon that. So essentially, 
I think it's fair to characterize a lot of our ag um, policy, law policy, as characterized by this boom and bust cycle and the federal government's attempts to pass policies that will try to shore up producers. And um, that takes on several different forms, whether it's from trying to control production uh, by essentially taking lands out of production, uh, paying farmers to do that, um, which is an old trick, um, or providing direct payments. Um, so we see those kind of tactics used really over the 20th century, sometimes to, to greater effect than other times, um, but always being tweaked. Um, and we still do that today. And I would say that we still haven't found the right recipe. Um, so again, uh, after the Great Depression, farmers start um, really doing quite well, not surprisingly, during World War II. And as you see on the slide, there's one of those um, classic pictures uh, or posters um, encouraging women to get back on the farm. So here's just kind of supporting my point about the government's unique um, role in farm policy. We have continued um, laws that are passed in order to provide credit, um, in order to remove distressed lands and pay for them. Um, that's actually how we got a lot of the national grasslands. Um, and at one point, actually, one of the main uh, ag pieces of legislation that was passed to the Agriculture Adjustment Act was found unconstitutional, so they had to pass it again. Um, so you just see this repeated in, into the 40s and the 50s, and I'm not going to go through all these, but you'll say um, lunch program was introduced around that time. And then we get to the, um, to the 50s and the 60s. Um, and at this time, this debate that we, we kind of still have today between, um, in, in some respects, I mean, between those um, stakeholders or those legislators who really want to keep price supports and mandatory production controls as a way to help the ag sector and those who really want to go back to a more market-based uh, uh, way of dealing with farm prices and the ag sector. So the, in 1965, what results is what some people call the first modern farm bill, the Food and Agriculture Act, uh, and it really reflects a compromise between those two approaches. And this really takes us into what some people call the modern era. And then we have um, really farm bills passed pretty much between every four and six years, all the way through till now. There are a couple of really important farm bills that I wanted to mention or call out in particular. Um, one of them is the Agriculture and Consumer Protection Act of 1973. That's considered to be the first omnibus. Um, and by omnibus, I mean really adds in other existing laws and kind of wraps them all together. Um, and, and I'm going to go over just in next, actually, how the Farm Bill really is a creature of accretion, um, not so much of planning or strategy. And then the other, I think, real turning point uh, was the Food Security Act of 1985, um, which included the first true conservation title. There were uh, there was conservation put into prior farm bills or legislative uh, or legislation, like for example, for soil to try to reduce soil erosion, but but they were often really tied to that idea of trying to control production or support farmers. But this, um, the '85 Act, was um, really the first true standalone conservation. So that's where we get conservation compliance, which is vital, and I'll talk about that in a little bit as well as some of the first um, uh, uh, easement programs, like the Wetlands Reserve Program, which became very, very popular. Um, and then the Ag Act of 2014, and then our most current agriculture uh, for our farm bill, which was um, 2018. And that was passed in December of 2018. I think that a lot of us didn't think it was gonna happen, but, um, but it was, and that was pretty amazing. And so that's what we, have now. So that's a rundown of those so-called modern farm bills. But I did want to, you know, like I said, talk a little bit about the evolution. And so um, really we see the pieces that reflect humanitarian 
uh, and trade policies. Those really came into uh, to place in the 60s. In the 70s, we saw um, food stamps are now known as the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, that was incorporated in 1973, but it was originally part of LBJ, LBJ's Great Society. The 80s, as I noted, um, were the conservation programs, and those would actually um, grow until uh, the mid-2000s, and now they've really stabilized. In fact, in the last Farm Bill, there was a, a great fight to actually uh, try to keep them funded at a, a, at a reasonable level. Um, and then the 90s, where we saw credit research and extension in rural development. Um, credit's been around for a long time, as you saw in those earlier slides, um, especially because, you know, during the, the Dust Bowl and lots of farmers um, going bankrupt. But then one of the more modern uh, or, uh, case of farmers um, going through bankruptcies is, is really in the 80s, uh, where people became more aware. And, and that's one of the reasons, actually, I think in the 85 Farm Bill, we managed to get conservation in there. Um, and that's really kind of where farm aid came, let people know farm aid. Um, and I'm going to talk about bankruptcies uh, again, because because they're, the economic situation of a lot of agriculture pr producers is still a very, very important issue um, that is uh, has reverberations today. Um, so again, so the loan programs, they've been with the far, with Farm Bill or a version of the Farm Bill for 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 a long time now. Um, incorporated research and extension. These are old programs. That's why we have um, actually the extension programs in land grant universities going back to the Morrill Acts in the late 1800s. Um, and then incorporating rural development programs, um, which have a lot of shared authorities with the credit title. There's actually quite a bit of rural development in the Farm Bill, um, which is important. Um, it's, it's a really key key component that a lot of people don't always recognize, but like, and that goes back to really rural electrification in the, you know, the 30s, um, and now it's really reflected in bringing uh, high-speed internet and things like that to, uh, and, and to economic development to rural areas. So this is, um, okay, and then finally, and this is very important actually, of the 2000s, we saw a forestry title added energy. Energy really came in when the oil prices were really spiking in the earlier part of this um, um, millennium. Uh, and so we saw, and this is really where corn ethanol started to come in and real, a real tie-in with um, the energy department's appropriations, um, horticulture, which contains parts of the organic program, which are very important. Organics have really come online in the last 20 years. Um, exponentially, actually, um, and in part, in great part, I think that's because we have a national organic standard. Um, and then beginning ranchers and farmers, as well as so-called socially disadvantaged farmers, um, I think there's been a lot more attention, but not nearly enough, to those segments of the population, especially, um, you know, when Mike was talking about equity, there has been, a, you know, a history of um, racism at the USDA um, going back over a hundred years, well, going back since the you know the beginning of the um, of the department, and we've had class action lawsuits filed against the uh, the USDA because of discrepancies in how it um, implements its program. So um, more attention to that, I think, is is recognized, but more needs to be done given the um, really the the history uh, and the legacy of um, you know, institutional racism within our agricultural policies. This, uh, I, I wanted to sh show this graph because I know I showed one earlier when we first started, but this really shows over time how the different um, subjects have, uh, subjects that are uh, covered by the Farm Bill, how the appropriations and the outlays has changed over time. And I think it's important to, to really note that you know, we used to have a lot of direct payments under the uh, farm commodity programs or the so-called uh, farm safety net, but that in recent years has switched to crop insurance. And one of the reasons, although crop insurance has been around since the 1930s, is a very favorable uh, premium um, assistance that uh, the federal government provides for producers and most producers, uh, most commodity crop producers do have crop insurance. It's about on an average about 60% we cover of that premium. 
Um, and that was done intentionally because we wanted farmers to get off direct payments and onto crop insurance. So, but that is uh, an element of policy that I think really honestly begs for reform uh, because it kind of masks the true risk and I think it's not used as a, effectively as a policy lever. Um, okay, so talking about policy again, one of the things that I think is really important to ask, and, and this goes to thinking about um, our food and agriculture uh, systems, if you will, in terms of systems thinking. So this is not really a purpose statement, but this is how the 2018 Farm Bill begins. To provide for the reform and continuation of agriculture and other programs of the Department of Agriculture through fiscal year 2023 and for other purposes. So essentially, it's really not much of a purpose statement. And I think uh, my contention is that it's, a, it's really a huge missed opportunity. Um, and it also reflects fundamentally, I believe, a lack of, of a framework uh, to ensure that we do have uh, sustainable food and agriculture, as well as uh, robust and vibrant rural communities into the future. Um, but the good news is that's fixable, right? So I'll talk a little bit about that. And partly the reason why I think we don't have this kind of uniform or unifying framework um, that set forth values, um, policy values, is because, in part, because it's an omnibus. You know, I wanted to go through this um, this kind of accretion of of the farm bill over time to show that that's really what's happened. That these titles have been added over time. And I thought it, I think it's important to say omnibus generally means for all for everybody, and you kind of do get that in this farm bill. There is something for everyone. Uh, but the problem is that it doesn't always hang together in a way that's cohesive or um, in a way that there's policy alignment that actually supports and makes policy effective, which is, as good governance people, that's, you know, as attorneys, that's what we'd like to see. Um, the other thing is that omnibus bills tend to be complex, contradictory, as I just noted, and they're difficult to debate as a whole. So they do have uh, some some serious drawbacks. So I thought I'd take this part of the presentation. I, how much time do I have left here? Um, not that much. And just talk about well, what should a farm bill policy be? Um, and then I, I want to just provide a little bit of background here. I said at the beginning that I think that you could actually look at the farm bill as a land spell, and this was a really great um, image that Bloomberg News um, had. I think it was a couple years ago. And why I love it is because it really shows that essentially most of America is still rural. Most of us are, are urban dwellers, so we don't realize that, but really the vast uh, green infrastructure of America is in fact rural. And much of the land, one way or the other, is used for agricultural or forestry production. At the USDA, we actually have the Forest Service in part because in some definitions of agriculture include forestry, and I'm going to hear. So if you look at this, it's really stunning. And so it also shows you the, the real reach of, of the Farm Bill over uh, the United States. So, and this gets to a little bit of what, um, what Michael was talking about. Um, why it's so important, I think, to really include sustainability both in our dietary guidelines, which you know there was an attempt to do the last time, as Michael noted, but also in our major uh, policy efforts like the Farm Bill, is the reality of climate change, which is here. So this is um, WRI uh, projecting uh, yield declines, and you'll note that the yield declines um, are primarily concentrated in, in most of the world in developing countries. And, um, and consequently, developing countries are the ones who will be demanding more meat production, as we did, as they graduate more people into the middle class. And this really underscores the, the point that Michael made. Um, there's no way, we, we actually can't produce what we're producing right now in a sustainable manner, but to increase production um, in that manner would certainly um, wreak tremendous devastation, bluntly. 
Um, and this is another World Resource Institute infographic. I think it's pretty compelling. A lot of people lately in the food movement have been very interested in reducing food waste. Cities like San Francisco have been very successful in reducing composting generally. I think it's a great thing. It's very important to note that even if we have successes globally on reducing food waste, and we need to do that because it's low hanging fruit, it still will not be enough. And I want to just briefly go over resource concerns as well. So this is um, uh, this is a USDA infographic of the United States. It shows over from 82 to uh, 2012 uh, soil erosion. And why I wanted to bring this up is because, you know, despite the fact that we're, you know, nearly a century past uh, the Dust Bowl, we still lose about 1 point, almost 1.7 billion tons of topsoil, mainly from farming, every year. And partly where it goes is places like the Gulf of Mexico um, and or the Great Lakes or Chesapeake or I'm up in Northern New England, so uh, Lake Champlain. So we're use, losing a lot of nutrients in, in a lot of areas, even though we spent a lot of money on trying to improve environmental outcomes, especially under the Farm Bill, under the conservation title. Um, we have not been able to make significant strides in addressing the environmental harms from ag production. Um, and we have to really think about coupling, you know, this is going to be exacerbated when we couple that with um, the increasing extreme weather events. This is a picture from North Carolina, two hogs trying to get to higher ground um, from, I think, one of the hurricanes. But we saw this last year with the uh, Midwest floods. And that's, the thing is that this is kind of, it's, they're here to stay. So we're going to have more of these extreme weather events. Um, and our lands being less resilient um, are, uh, are an area of concern. Okay, so here are also the economic concerns. I mentioned um, really the plight of the American farmer, um, which continues as well as we're losing um, younger people from rural areas. They're going to um, metro or, or quasi-metro areas. We do have some influx of people to rural areas, but they tend to be older folks. And as many know now, uh, the, the average age of farmers is getting, um, is getting older. It's at least 58 years old. I think it's getting closer to 59 years. Um, this is an infographic, again, from the Farm Bureau. It shows that um, um, last year, you know, there was an increase of 24% of uh, farmer bankruptcies. And that's, um, that's very concerning. And I wanted to also mention um, SNAP. We talk, I talked a little bit about so-called, you know, uh, or they used to be called food stamps, but um, it, it might be the biggest part of the Farm Bill. It certainly is incredibly essential that we have this program, but it really works out to a very, very modest amount uh, for those who are in the greatest, greatest need in this country. And we will see the need for SNAP um, grow, given what's happening right now with the coronavirus. So talking about a systems approach, um, one of the things that I, I advocate for is, is really um, three main areas that are interlocking when we think about our food and agriculture policy, and that is to ensure food security, rural resilience, both for, um, both for the environment and economic reasons, um, and healthy rural communities. Um, and I think that we will really see some of the fissures right now in terms of the, you know, the ability of the rural healthcare uh, systems to deal with the coronavirus, um, just the kind of supports that people in rural areas need, and they, they may not be there, um, and why it's so important to have uh, to strengthen that. So my punchline is this, is it time to move beyond the omnibus farm bill? And when I say that, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying um, it's too broken to be fixed. I'm wondering in general if it's just the wrong framework. And so it's a big question, but I think it's worth asking. And, um, and that's it in a nutshell. I appreciate Thanks, people's Lauren. time. Oh, 
Great. Yeah. And I'd love to have any questions that you might have. Thanks, Larry. I apologize for the delay there. I was having having some technical issues on my end. Um, you touched on the coronavirus a little bit, but we haven't really dug into that. And it's obviously on people's minds. Mm -hmm. What relevance, if any, does the Farm Bill have on, on helping society respond to the economic and social dislocations that are on the way? Um, and, and how do you see that playing out? That's a, a great question. And I, and I think I think it really helps people listening to this to see the relevance uh, broadly in our society. I, I think SNAP is going to be under great pressure. And in fact, I would imagine that there would have to be sub I'm just imagining supplemental appropriations because there'd be there would be more people that are going to be um, you know significantly below the poverty line and that are losing jobs. The jobless rates are already up, so that's going to be a critical safety net. Is is SNAP and um, but I think in general um, you know just that rural resilience piece and having rural development, but in a way that really honors kind of our natural infrastructure strengthening that and having a more coherent approach to that in the farm bill is really is really needed and so i'm actually hoping just like we saw at 9 11 um when there were there when there were policy changes made that you normally wouldn't see um like for example setting up the department of homeland security um that this might be an opening this crisis might be an opening to really take stock and how uh, very critical uh, pieces of legislation like the Farm Bill can be strengthened to provide the not only the farm safety net, but but just build that kind of economic and environmental resilience that we need in order to deal with a world that's getting closer and that's really under stress from climate change. Thanks. I think that's a really helpful perspective. Um, I was struck during your presentation, you had a, a slide that that showed uh, land distribution. And mm -hmm. there was a, a significant portion in the, the Southeast that was dedicated to ethanol production. So I'm wondering if you can talk about the nexus between the farm bill and liquid transportation fuels. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically about corn-based corn -based ethanol. And I'm wondering how the farm bill shapes um, our, our options and opportunities when we're thinking about transportation fuels. Sure. Yeah, that was that got in there because of our, our concerns about oil prices and the interest in, in renewables. But, um, you know, to me, it represents what we've consistently done is try to create markets like creating corn syrup markets and things like that for corn production. I think we need we need to take a hard look. It's another example a hard systems based look at at our policies and the unintended consequences of them um, and then really focus on you know those developments of renewables and other ways to transition to clean energy that when you look at a life cycle analysis are actually more effective and we need the places that we grow corn those are our key it's not really in the southeast although there is some it's mainly in the you know the uh mississippi basin especially iowa is our top uh, corn producer but um we need those lands for food production actually and and a huge chunk of corn production goes to either livestock feed or to or, or into ethanol uh and not as human food Great. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, the Clean Water Act as well. The, the Farm Bill contains provisions accepting certain agricultural practices from uh, the Clean Water Act. And uh, could you talk about the, how those two really important laws fit together? Yeah. You know, in fact, I, I, we only have so much time this afternoon. You know, I gave the conservation title a short shrift and I normally I would lavish a lot of love and attention on it, but I wasn't able to do that today. Um, so just to clarify, it's the Clean Water Act that provides the agriculture sector with the exemptions, especially under 4F and other provisions. So a lot of people don't realize this, but um, many agricultural practices, even though they might end up being looking like a point source, are exempted. Um, and there's there's some argument for that, but the problem is, is that largely because of that, we have yeah, actually agriculture non-point source pollution is a leading source of water pollution uh, and i noted that too so what we've pursued in america really is a policy of voluntary conservation for um 
for agricultural lands, and that is mainly funded under the conservation title of Farm Bill, which is successful and I think it's really necessary, but it's not, it's not gonna cut it. Voluntary conservation is not gonna solve environmental problems. What we do have that's quasi-regulatory under the conservation title is called conservation compliance. And that requires for uh, farmers uh, under the Farm Bill lingo, they're often called producers, in order to receive the many benefits that they can receive under the Farm Bill, um, farmers are not supposed to um, convert a wetland for the purposes of producing a commodity. Because uh, if they do that, then they're supposed to lose their benefits. Um, so it is potentially powerful, it is quasi-regulatory, but that is, that's like the closest thing I think that you get to like as a typical regulatory lever in the Farm Bill when you compare it to the Clean Water Act. So when we're on those uh, private American working lands, we're really looking at conservation compliance to help reduce soil erosion and improve water quality and not lose those wetlands. Um, and, that's, and that is different than um, waters of the United States under the Clean Water Act, which um, you know, is, is largely governed by, um, by the Army Corps. Great, and final question. Uh, if you had a magic wand, what changes would you make to food law and, and the Farm Bill in particular and, and why? And does the current, pardon me, does the current crisis provide the policy openings to make those kinds of, of major substantive changes? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, well, I think if I had a magic wand, and I would say the food law is partially embedded in the Farm Bill, but it's also other things too. It's conservation law, natural resources law, agricultural law. Um, I would say that we need, we need a purpose statement and I think a real framework that is built around sustainability and resilience, and we don't have that. I mean, if you do a word search in the Farm Bill, last time I did anyway, I think there was, climate change might have been mentioned twice, which is pretty amazing for such a long bill. Um, that is, that's really not part of, of the Farm Bill, and that's to our peril. So, um, so, that, so that's why, partly why I think, I, I wonder if the Farm Bill is, if we, if we should keep on recycling it, or if we should think about is there a better way to do this that really ensures a food secure future and, and rural resilience for America? Well, thank you, Laurie. I appreciate your comments. I think that that wraps us up and it's, it's time to take us to lunch. All right. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.